Doug, say what these are for people as they're coming on. This is actually the secret press conference that took place in South Vietnam after signing the treaty. This is me with the Saigon Student Union. The guy in the center was Win Tan Mom. Now we're moving to Hanoi. Um, this is the Lake of the Returned Sword, and this is a street outside of our hotel. This is what Hanoi looked like in 1970. This is actually a bomb shelter and children standing on top of it. You can see in the background there, there's another bomb shelter there around the lake. Keith Barker's in a lot of these pictures. <laughs> I don't remember being on that lake in that little kayak. <laughs> yeah, I didn't remember that either. When I read Becca's diary, uh, th that chapter of the book, that sort of helped me remember a lot of stuff. But it's I still don't remember being in that boat. <laughs> <laughs> Was that guy in the mustache, was that um, um, the guy you just talked to last night, Keith? Oh, yeah, Mark. With, with the, the bar bar bar. mustache? Yeah, and he still has the mustache, too. <laughs> this is out at Halam Bay. Somewhere this is back in Hanoi. There's Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Mark Resnick. Mark. And Mark was going is on this call in There's, the audience. So we'll wrong, bring him right? up later on. Oh. Yep, Mark is on now. So this was pre-motorbikes. They were now it's all motorbikes. Yeah. yeah. David Ifshin, who was the president of the NSA, standing there. Yeah, we had uh, many formal dinners and uh, uh, fabulous entertainment. <coughs> we were there. Doug, tell me when the sequence is over and as soon as that happens, we'll go to the program. Sure, I'll just stop share as soon as we reach the end. Okay. Are you guys in touch with any of the actual delegates from Vietnam? Are they still, any of them still? Yes, I uh, was in email communication with uh, Win Tan Mom, okay. who is now a medical doctor, uh, lives in Ho Chi Minh City, um, mm -hmm. and he will be on the second webinar that we'll Great. be doing. Um, and, and Long is in touch with him, has been more in touch with him even, and has, yeah. has been with him. Um, right. And Doug and I actually met with him uh, when we were in Vietnam in 2000, what was it, 13? Uh, with Becca, yes. With Becca. Right. Yeah. Uh, I met with Madame Bin uh, maybe three years ago. Oh, and really? How is she doing? I, I... Uh, she had just finished an autobiography and she was uh, quite impressive, very uh, uh, wow. Very alert and engaged, and uh, had an office which where she worked from, and it was very moving to see her again. That's I excellent. Had known her quite well in yeah. the uh, period of yeah. the Paris negotiations. As, as I'll mention in my talk, I had a lovely day with her in, in, in 1970, and she's still alive, right? As far as we yeah. know. She yes. is alive, yeah. not well, but uh, is is alive um, in Hanoi. Great. Oh. I think she we'll seemed quite frail. Well I enough to her, but, uh, mentally very alert. Yes. 
There we are signing in Hanoi with David Ibsen and myself. That's our motley crew. And this is with the uh, Prime Minister of Vietnam, Phan Van Dam. You could take pictures. Great. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. We have 45 participants, so we're not quite at everybody who registered, but we're certainly close enough to start. Um, I'm John McAuliffe uh, with the Fund for Reconciliation, and in this case, uh, the identity is the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. Um, we uh, have existed since 2015 uh, as an effort to try to uh, bring back memories of what the anti-war movement was about and both for the, sh the saving of that history, um, since that's not being done um, by more mainstream institutions. In fact, one might say that some mainstream institutions have been trying to hide that history including the, the Burns Novick series. Um, so we've been trying to, using the vehicle of 50th anniversaries to find ways of bringing together people who played historic roles and uh, where uh, this is one more of those programs. This is the first program about the People's Peace Treaty. Um, it's going to talk about the history of how it got put together and also then how it got used in the United States. Um, and then it, the, towards the end of April, we will have another session, including Vietnamese, including some of the people who participated on the Vietnamese side in the creation of it. Uh, mechanically, for, in case you don't know, webinar formats, um, if you have a question, click on the Q&A and then fill out your question. Um, I have left it so that all questions will be visible. Um, and uh, also the alternative way of communicating is chatting. Now, just to make things simpler, uh, please don't use the chat for questions. Use the chat to communicate to other people on the call, or you can communicate with a particular person. At least, at least I can. I we've had mixed experience whether the participants are also able to access the individual lists. But um, if you can't, it's just a limit. All right, someone's saying you can't. So. Um, but you can use the part, the chat to send either to the panelists or to all attendees collectively. What would be most helpful to see there is if you were part of the People's Peace Treaty when you were uh, during the, the spring, winter spring of 1971, if you were at all involved with using it as an organizing tool or getting it approved by an institution, um, or you have other specific memories, if you can say on the chat that you would like to participate uh, and after the, the program is over, we'll, we'll recognize you at least by voice and maybe be able to also get your picture on. Um, so those are that we will, when this is all over, we will put the chat on the same page uh, where the, um, information, the bios and the speaker of speakers and the program are. If you go to the top of chat, you'll see the first URL is of the home page for this webinar. And that has all of the speakers and all their bios in the speaker list is in order. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on introductions. So flash back to that link. Uh, if you if you want more information or go look at it afterwards. We will put this whole program up on YouTube. It takes me a day or two to do it. And then uh, I'll be sending a note out to everybody 
uh, to tell them the link to see it. Um, there will be a page up that will show our website at some point, which is the actually vietnampeace.org. And on that website, there's a whole bunch of information about VPCC and also a donation page, which we would uh, naturally be grateful to whatever people are able to contribute. Uh, Zoom is not a free, we're making it free to you, but it's not free to us, especially when we go into the webinar format. Um, so at any rate, I'm, that's the end of the intro technically, and it's now Jay Craven is moderating and he will carry it from here. And I will say, I will try to either pull up questions to be asked later or, or open for people to ask them directly, or, and we will open to people who have stories to tell. Jay. Great, thank you, John. I wanna welcome everyone who's joining us this afternoon and um, briefly tell you, I was one of the delegates on the People's Peace Treaty uh, delegation to Vietnam and I'll be offering some comments about that during the program. But I wanted to open just by briefly indicating that the Peace Treaty was an initiative of the United States National Students Association. Uh, and it was commissioned in August, 1970 at the NSA convention at McAllister College uh, in Minnesota. Uh, and my recollection, which is pretty clear because I had written about it at the time for the Boston Phoenix, um, I was there as a student body president from Boston University's College of Liberal Arts, but I also wrote about it. In any case, my recollection, Charlie Palmer, who was the outgoing president of the National Student Association, um, expressed that he had received and he had an initiative from South Vietnamese student leaders, the Saigon Student Union, proposing the idea of a people-to-people -people peace treaty uh, that would be carried out by student leaders from South Vietnam, North Vietnam, the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam, and the United States. You know, as such, this was an unusual idea that all four of these parties would join together, frankly, for anything. Uh, so it was endorsed by the delegates. Um, there was discussion and a little bit of debate, but people embraced it as a good idea. Initially, uh, the, the trip was imagined uh, to take place in Geneva or Prague, where the student leaders would come together. And the NSA had some history of meetings like that with international student leaders. But as the logistics came together, um, it turned out to be headed for Vietnam. And I think Larry, who will speak a little bit later, will know something about that. Um, the visas for the delegation, however, were blocked to South Vietnam by the Saigon government, presumably in um, coordination with the United States State Department. So faced with that obstacle, uh, there was a bit of a hush-hush uh, surrounding what we would do, and lo and behold, we were able to slip, sneak, covertly enter one of our delegates, Doug Hostetter, who's here with us today, who did make it to Saigon, who did meet with the South Vietnamese students, and who did produce the draft document of the peace treaty. Uh, there's a bit of high stakes intrigue following that, which we won't go into in detail. Uh, although when Doug made it to Laos in, in transit to North Vietnam, he was uh, beset upon by secret police and agents who tried to get the copy of the peace treaty from him. But in his own stealthy way, which again, only he knows, uh, he was able to hold on to it, get to, get to Hanoi to join the rest of the delegation and carry out the talks there. The, um, I will just end by saying that uh, President Eisenhower in a, in a talk with Prime Minister Macmillan in London, at the very end of his presidency, made a comment that is sometimes referenced in relationship to the peace treaty. And that comment was, quote, I like to believe that people in the long run are going to do more to promote peace than our governments. Indeed, he said, I think that people want peace so much that one of these days governments had better get out of the way and let them have it. So, uh, we set the stage for a discussion of the People's Peace Treaty. We're gonna start with Richard Falk, who was um, a mentor to many of us back in those days for his writings and uh, 
um, commentary about uh, the Vietnam War uh, in his role as a professor of international law at Princeton University. Uh, in 2008, he was named by the United Nations Human Rights Council to a six-year term as a UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Palestinian territories occupied since 1967. Uh, Dick, welcome to you. And uh, you're gonna help set the stage for us a little bit. And uh, we're thinking of this moment in time, 1970, 1971, around the Vietnam War. Uh, thanks so much, Jay, for the uh, kind words. And I'm very happy to be part of this uh, fascinating event. Uh, in order to talk about 1970-71, I think it's important to say two things about 1968 as a foundation, because I, I believe the whole understanding of the war by the US government uh, changed after the Tet Offensive in February of 1968 and was reinforced by the withdrawal by Lyndon Johnson from running for the presidency. In effect, the US understood that it had lost the war. That is, it had lost the effort to create a uh, viable, sustainable state in South Vietnam. But what it didn't do what, at that time or for several years later was to acknowledge that this had happened. It was desperate to avoid the stigma of being defeated. And it was also extremely intent on not being seen as having abandoned its supposed ally, but uh, existential puppet in Saigon. Uh, the Saigon government. And those two elements that uh, really collided with what uh, the People's Peace Treaty proposed and what the North Vietnamese government and the NLF were prepared to accept. I had the personal uh, access to uh, Prime Minister Phan Van Dung uh, in June of 1968, when I visited uh, Hanoi, and he outlined what would be acceptable in terms of a peace treaty that resembles very much the People's Peace Treaty, and uh, also was reported quite widely when I returned in the New York Times and the front page of the New York Times, and was... Um, acceptable in ways that are very uh, ironic in retrospect, because it was seven years later, really, that the full consummation of this peace process occurred, which produced hundreds of thousands of casualties on the Vietnamese and American sides that had no relationship to the uh, re realization in Washington that the war was lost. And so all of this face-saving diplomacy, which was very destructive because it included the Christmas bombing of 1972, I believe, uh, uh, which was very destructive. Uh, and, and this, uh, dynamic of uh, killing for the sake of saving diplomatic face was more or less documented by the Pentagon Papers that were released in this period uh, as well. And so one of the takeaway uh, notions from this uh, experience in this at that time is that the US government throughout the latter stages of the Vietnam War definitely had no trust in its own population, that it kept from the American people the fact that it was losing the war and that it uh, 
its supposed mission could not be completed. And uh, this complicated the superficial effort to uh, put enough pressure on North Vietnam that it would hide the fact that it had won the war. See, the, the other side of hiding the loss of the war was also hiding uh, the victory of the North Vietnamese and the NLF. And the People's Peace Treaty, which came uh, three years after this, these conversations I had had uh, with uh, Phan Van Dang in uh, Hanoi, really uh, resembled in many, in its uh, fundamental contours, both what Phan Van Dang was prepared to accept in 68 on behalf of the Vietnamese government, and also what Kissinger negotiated and received one of the most darkest Nobel Peace Prizes in the history of that uh, very prestigious uh, award. Uh, so what I think we can uh, understand uh, from this period and from the uh, real populist impulses that the People's Peace Treaty and the anti-war movement and the Eisenhower quote all reinforce is that uh, there was this an strong push toward a peace between the two peoples that was endorsed by the governmental authorities on the winning side, but was resisted by uh, Saigon and by Washington for face-saving reasons as long as they could. They ended up, of course, not saving face. So it was not only a uh, very destructive kind of uh, uh, effort to prevent peace diplomacy, but it also produced in the end the very result that they uh, feared, uh, the images of people escaping from Saigon, holding on to uh, the uh, helicopters that were lifting off from the American embassy, the boat people, the whole saga of the outcome of the war really dramatized the fact that had the People's Peace Treaty been uh, accepted or been used as the negotiating tool on the U.S. side, much of the loss of face could have, could have been and would have been avoided. And therefore, it is a great uh, lesson in the role that peace movements can play uh, and the further uh, unfortunate realization that the US government then, and I think subsequently, is not prepared to allow its own people to know either the truth about uh, peace diplomacy or to exert a constructive influence. Let me stop there. You're on mute, Jay. Thank you very much, Dick. Uh, I believe we have some uh, supporting materials also that are available on the web page. Uh, and I recently came across an interesting article by Ted Schultz for Foreign Affairs talking about the history of the secret diplomacy between Le Duc Tho and Henry Kissinger that I recommend, particularly for the ways that it makes some of the points that Dick did and parallels some of the issues that we had in the People's Peace Treaty. Larry Magid is going to speak next. Uh, Larry was working with the National Student Association at the time of the People's Peace Treaty. He's a technology journalist uh, and an internet safety advocate. Uh, we just made reconnection with Larry recently, and so we're thrilled to have him here. So, Larry. 
Thank you, Jay. First, I want to add to Richard Falk's excellent presentation, his final comment about had the government listened to the students, not only would we have saved face, but we would have saved, um, I don't know how many thousands of lives. I mean, it's, it, it, it strikes me that, uh, you know, the impact that we could have had had the government listened to the young people of which we were all at the time. Uh, I just want a brief history. The National Student Association was one of many uh, organizations of its kind around the world at the time, uh, both in the Soviet sphere and the, uh, in the Western part of the world. Many governments had, or I should say many governments, many countries had what in unions of students. What wasn't known when the Student Association was operating during the 50s, it was formed in, in 1947, was that through the, from the 50s through around 1968, it was controlled or at least influenced heavily by the CIA, which had infiltrated it. That was a secret situation that was exposed in Ramparts Magazine in 67. The reason I bring that up is that the response once the expose took place was that the NSA expelled the CIA, sought alternative forms of funding, and then brought in new leadership, uh, or you know, as, it, as it did every year, there was always new leadership. It brought in leadership, which I truly believe was not in any way connected with the CIA. And one of those leaders was Charlie Palmer, who I knew when he was student body president at Berkeley, and I was uh, an activist, anti-war and uh, civil rights activist at Berkeley, as was Charlie. Um, as Jay mentioned, Charlie did go to Saigon uh, during 1970, I believe the spring, uh, I remember that trip because I was working with him at the time and Charlie and I had a conversation just yesterday where he certainly recalled that trip to Saigon. He has a somewhat different recollection. Uh, I, I think all of us uh, are, can be forgiven for having a fuzzy memory going back 50 years, uh, but nevertheless, uh, he did go to Saigon. He did meet with student leaders. And as Jay reported, based on Jay's notes, uh, that apparently had did lead to uh, the origins of what we call the People's Peace Treaty. Uh, as per history, I also want to give a great uh, shout out to J. Edgar Hoover. Um, I, back in the 70s, got my FBI file. I'm sure virtually everyone uh, on this panel uh, has these files, or if they don't have them in their possession, the government does. And I never paid much attention to it, frankly, uh, until that last week when I decided to look through it. And the FBI did a very good job in documenting a lot of what happened during that period. There are hundreds of pages in my file, which most of which have nothing to do with me, but which document various aspects of the political movement at the time, including clippings from the National Student Association conferences. So even though they didn't really get so much into the People's Peace Treaty, uh, there was a fair amount of background information that helped uh, in this. Um, as, as Jay mentioned, NSA passed the resolution in the Student Congress in August of 1970, and it was its new officers were mandated to uh, begin the process of creating this treaty, as well, by the way, uh, also mandated a number of anti-war activities. And, and there was one line in the resolution that said, if the war wasn't over by May of 1970, a very optimistic thing to say, then the NSA would support a series of nonviolent civil disobedient protests. Uh, in any case, uh, David Ifshan asked me to help. And on November 1st, 1970, I was on my way to Algiers and Paris uh, the Algerian portion was to meet with uh, Eldridge Cleaver to ch chat about some things. Uh, and the Paris portion was to meet with folks from, uh, it turned out the, uh, the provisional revolutionary government uh, uh, rec representatives to the, United, to the uh, Paris peace talks. I don't know if you could see my screen, but at the airport, Rennie Davis, who was very instrumental in this, uh, who died very, very, very recently, met me and he took out a yellow pad of paper and hand wrote, a letter of introduction to uh, Madam Bin of me. And this is an image of that letter. By complete coincidence, my wife stumbled on this Xerox copy in a filing cabinet just the other day. And that letter basically pointed out, uh, and I have a copy of the transcript of it here. When I was in Paris, I discussed with you an idea of a citizen's peace treaty, a kind of joint communique signed by the Vietnamese and Americans outlining the correct steps for ending the war. The concept of a citizen's peace treaty is gaining enormous support in the United States, especially with moderate and hard to reach groups. Larry can explain about the idea of the treaty in greater detail and our plans for ratifying the treaty throughout the United States. So that was Rennie Davis's uh, or introduction to Madam Bin of this treaty. Madam Bin and I had a very wonderful conversation 
not only about the treaty, but other aspects of the anti-war movement. And uh, that was my primary involvement at that point. Uh, I came back to Washington. I also met in London with uh, anti-war uh, leaders in the UK. Um, I had hoped that Eldred would spread the word among the Black Panther community about this treaty. I'm not exactly sure. Keith might be able to speak to that in more detail. But in any case, that was the beginning. Uh, from there, of course, we went back to Washington, or I went back to Washington, and uh, David and I and others began the process of selecting delegates who would go to Vietnam uh, for the treaty. And of course, that's where uh, the, the other folks here can pick up. Um, somebody's on. Becca looks like she wants to speak or somebody's. Oh, Jay, you're yeah, on mute. I need to be unmuted. Okay. And, and speakers should make sure they are muted as much as possible uh, when they're not speaking, just so we avoid extraneous sound. Uh, next up is Doug Hostetter, who was part of our delegation and is the one member who did get into Saigon during the trip. Doug has really devoted his entire life to activism. Uh, he is a peace pastor in the Mennonite church. He was a conscientious objector during the war who did his alternative service working in Vietnam. Uh, so Doug, take it away and um, we'll go from there. And Doug also, Doug headed up the national office of the People's Peace Treaty, also was very involved there. So he knows a lot about what happened when it came back. Thank you, Jay. Uh, actually, I didn't head up the office. Uh, Bob Greenblatt actually was the one who headed the office at that time. Um, I was one of the volunteer workers there. And I was also, as Jay mentioned, the only member of the peace treaty delegation that made it into Saigon uh, and then came out, uh, went to Bangkok, Vien Chin, and eventually caught a plane uh, into Hanoi and met up with the rest of the delegation. If you wanna learn more about that particular part, we're having another webinar probably the, sometime in the second half of April, which will uh, get into the logistics of the People's Peace Treaty. Today, I wanted to talk about my, my role in, uh, in the national office. And I wanted to read from just a couple of reports from that era. This is from a March report. The Peace Treaty Office now has offices in 12 American cities. 300 student body presidents have endorsed the treaty that we know of, and at least 10 schools, there have been campus-wide referendums and it has passed in every one. Um, 30, uh, 25 student senates have passed the treaty and um, other organizers have endorsed the National uh, Lawyers Guild, the New Party, the New England World Federalist, Goddard College, um, and Goddard College has also offered, uh, said that they will offer scholarships to South Vietnamese students to come next year and for North Vietnamese students to attend Goddard as soon as the hostilities have stopped. Uh, there's also a new uh, uh, group in Hollywood called Entertainment Industry for Peace. And there are over a thousand already who have offered their services to help in fundraising events. Uh, the Committee of Return Volunteers has translated the People's Peace Treaty and literature about the treaty into Spanish to make it available to the Spanish community. Uh, we have also had a West Point cadet, the mayor of Des Moines, Iowa, and um, and of the University of Wis and, and the University of Wisconsin have signed a uh, a blood drive to raise uh, to collect blood for help in Vietnam. The Boston area churches are fasting um, and taking the, uh, the treaty to churches on Easter. That was from March of 1971. Uh, in April, another quick note, uh, these is a list of the organizations that had signed uh, organizationally by, uh, by April, the American Friends Service Committee, clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, the National Student Association, the National Welfare Rights Organization, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Women's Strike for Peace, and the People's Coalition for Peace and Justice. And then in my notes, uh, I also found um, a, um, a May event that we did in um, 
This is from a, a press release in uh, May 12, 1971. Uh, we would have a press conference on May the 12th on the east center steps of the Capitol. Um, we would be reading the names of the first 50,000 signatories of the People's Peace Treaty. We expected the reading to last for 24 hours. The readers would include all of the members of Congress who had signed the treaty, the former Senator Ernest Greening, Greening of Alaska, Carl Hess, members of the Harrisburg Conspiracy, Tim Butts, the, <coughs> the Vietnam veterans <coughs> against the war, and the writer Francine Duplessis Gray. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, states which are sending delegations for the readings include Illinois, Pennsylvania, um, New York, uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, Colorado, and Michigan. Following the reading of the first 50,000 names will, uh, will be inserted into the congressional record. The names of people who have ratified the treaty and who have pledged themselves to implement the People's Peace Treaty in their own lives will then become a matter of national public record. So it was pretty exciting um, uh, in the national office at that time, um, but I think I need to end now and give the time to other participants. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, we probably at some point should mention the book, When the People Make the Peace, maybe uh, also note that on the page, which Doug was a part of in writing about the peace treaty and about our trip to Vietnam. So um, take um, time if you can to check that out. Um, I'm gonna say a few words now just about my involvement. Um, I was recruited to go on the peace treaty delegation by Michael Lerner initially, who was a Seattle activist. Uh, and then was sent to a meeting with Rennie Davis and Dave Dellinger in Washington, where they were very explicit in their hope um, and their insistence, in fact, that in, in participating in the peace treaty delegation, I would also work towards the massive civil disobedience plans for May Day in Washington in May of 1971. So when I got back from Vietnam, I went on the road pretty much immediately starting January 10th to a big meeting in Chicago of peace groups, which became the first endorsers of the peace treaty and uh, also part of the discussion for May Day civil disobedience. I went from there and gave a presentation at the Winter Soldier uh, investigation at the Howard Johnson's outside Detroit. Uh, there was a big rally in Ann Arbor, Michigan that sort of launched the college focus of people's peace treaty activity. And from there I spent uh, pretty much the entire next several months on the road, speaking in more than a hundred places to college students, high school students, community colleges, church groups, rotary clubs, even inmates at Concord, Massachusetts State Penitentiary about the peace treaty, uh, urging people to circulate the treaty further and to also organize, mobilize for May Day demonstrations in Washington. Um, in some of the places that I went, uh, you know, Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, to Huntsville, Alabama, and Kirkland College, where I picked up an FBI informer who suddenly became my best friend. Uh, it was his, he ran the radical bookstore there, strangely, and his wife turned him into the movement, but that's a whole other story. Um, I sometimes appeared with other speakers. Uh, this amplified my ability to get out and, and communicate about the treaty, Howard Zinn, Noam Chomsky, Dan Ellsberg, John Kerry, Fred Bramfman, who did a lot of work on the air war in Laos, Paul Mayer, Dave Dellinger, Ekbel Ahmed, Gabriel Kolko, uh, Noving Lam, who is here today, uh, were all people that uh, were sort of circulating together during that time to really intensify the focus on the war. Uh, I was involved in the effort to present the peace treaty to the Cambridge City Council in Massachusetts. Uh, I strapped a couple of peace treaties on the back of mules and marched with Ralph, Reverend Ralph Abernathy to the steps of Congress to connect the goals of the peace treaty with a reduction in military spending to address the needs of the poor and improve schools. Uh, I spoke with Jane Fonda before a group of 5,000 people in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and 20 people in a living room in Newton, Massachusetts with Donald Sutherland reciting Dalton Trumbo's Johnny Got His Gun. And uh, Jane Fonda, in fact, gave us a, a print of They Shoot Horses, Don't They, uh, to go on the road and attract audiences for the People's Peace Treaty. And that, I did that for several weeks until 20th Century Fox tracked me down and said I couldn't do it anymore. 
Um, we also made a film, speaking of that, in 1970, the May Day film called Time is Running Out, which became a vehicle for getting out the word even further. We made 116 millimeter prints that were circulated all around the country for free to get the word out about the peace treaty. It clearly articulated the terms of the peace treaty to raise consciousness around that and also issued a call for the May Day demonstrations. Uh, for me, the, the peace treaty provided an ability to talk about this particular moment in the war, which we saw as an urgent moment, uh, focusing on the air war, the people living under the bombs in Vietnam and Laos, Agent Orange exposure, landmines, tiger cages, stories that veterans brought to Winter Soldier. It also provided an opportunity to talk about the Saigon peace movement, which Americans didn't really know much about, but were represented by the Saigon Student Union that took a huge risk in being involved in this international exchange, and some of them paid a price for it, uh, either through prison or surveillance and repression. Uh, the Saigon peace movement was a crucial factor, and I think Nobing Long will talk a little bit about that later. It allowed us to talk about terms for peace that would work, the setting of a date for the total withdrawal of American troops before the Vietnamese would release POWs. It's important to think back how much the POW issue was put forward as the ultimate issue for Americans to think about regarding the war. This made clear how to get the POWs back and extended that conversation. Um, it also gave us the chance, obviously, to talk about May Day and the civil disobedience that we wanted to implement the peace treaty as soon as possible, but that if we couldn't, then we would escalate tactics and commit civil disobedience behind the slogan, if the government won't stop the war, then the people will stop the government. One of the highlights in my work on the peace treaty involved testifying before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee with a delegate, delegation of others working on the peace treaty in May Day, where we were given a somewhat difficult reception. We were the next ones up after John Kerry's celebrated testimony. Uh, we talked about the very issues that I've outlined here and made a strenuous case both for the peace treaty and frankly to justify our May Day actions. And although we were treated fairly aggressively, uh, William Fulbright, the chairman of the committee, came to me in the, in the hallway afterwards and took me aside and said, you know, I'm really proud of what you all are doing in coming and pressing the case and taking risk and committing civil disobedience. And if only the students in Germany had done that to oppose the Nazis, just think what might have been possible. I said, well, why didn't you say that while we were on the, <laughs> giving our testimony? He, he patted me on the back and said, uh, it's politics, boy. Don't, don't, don't think anything else about it. Uh, anyway, I had certainly a, a rich experience uh, and an adventure in be involved in all this work. Uh, when I told Howard Zinn I wouldn't be able to go to his classes all spring, he said, I think it's worth uh, at least 15 credits if you can implement the peace treaty and stop the government from operating in the meantime. So that was my experience. Uh, Rebecca Wilson, um, Becca was part of our delegation and has been a longtime activist in uh, California. Is going to talk about some of her uh, activities there with, with the peace treaty. Uh, she's been involved in research and editing and journalism, uh, helped to start a newspaper out there. Becca. Oh, hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, the, it's hard to, obviously, to uh, summarize this in five minutes, but I'll try. Um, so I was one of the only two women on our delegation to Vietnam, the People's Peace Treaty delegation. And uh, when I came back, um, the anti-war movement locally was in a state of demoralization and decline. There was a, a sense of fragmentation and discouragement. The prior year had been incredibly uh, cataclysmic on our campus. The Bank of America had burned down in the student community right next to uh, UC Santa Barbara. A student had been killed by the police. Um, there had been massive demonstrations on campus and for the first time ever on our campus, which prior had been basically a party school, the police were called to quell demonstrations on campus. So that there was a, at the same time, you know, the invasion of Cambodia had happened the year before. There were massive student demonstrations about that. And, uh, um, and students were killed at Jackson State and Kent State. 
So that was also part of the atmosphere that I was coming back to in January of 1971. Um, and almost immediately, um, the People's Peace Treaty was taken up um, and by the, st the student body president at, the, at our school had just been elected recently and he was, he was the moderate candidate. The, the, the anti-war and more left candidate had lost, but the moderate candidate, uh, Tom Tosdell, decided that he totally supported the peace treaty and decided to institute a referendum on, on campus, which passed by an um, overwhelming majority. And um, my friends and I drove to Ann Arbor for the National People's Peace Treaty Conference and came back uh, excited about participating in this na uh, nation nationwide um, civil disobedience during what we called the seven days in May, which were planned, um, which Jay touched on, which were in, in uh, Washington were ab uh, absolutely massive demonstrations. And um, on campus uh, at this, Another thing that was that was happening right after I got back was that the, for the first time, the Vietnam veterans had a had a visibility on campus, and one of the main organizers of the um, Dewey Canyon demonstrations um, nationally of the VVAW in Washington D.C. was on our campus, and he he also totally supported the People's Peace Treaty. So the veterans themselves were actually carried the People's Peace Treaty as well. And the, I think the main accomplishment on our campus was that um, the whole student government basically got behind uh, sponsoring a, a statewide People's Peace Treaty convention, which brought together um, student and other anti-war organizations from all over the state to come together around the peace treaty, to use the peace treaty as a, as a framework. And so, as uh, someone else said, it was both both a framework for organizing, a, a way of focusing our organizing, and a way of talking about what was going on politically in South Vietnam. Um, so there were a lot of articles that came out about that. I wrote a long, uh, I published a long article about our trip in our news, in our student newspaper, and then we got we we got uh, going with planning all these May Day related events and. Um, locally. So we had, uh, and we also, we also tr tried, but did not succeed to get the People's Peace Treaty ratified by the local city council and the board of supervisors, but they both overwhelmingly rejected us. The, the local government at that time was totally Republican and conservative and wouldn't hear any, any of it. And some of them even accused us of being treasonous for making for uh, proposing um, a set the date and people's peace treaty. Um, and uh, the activists formed small collectives in, and we, we, uh, we, each of our collectives had a, had a different responsibility during the, the May Day demonstrations locally. And uh, I was involved in a demonstration at the local, at a GM research and development plant, which was making parts for bombs. And uh, I was arrested a couple of months later for that event. But that's another long story. But um, I think I've summarized it as much as well. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Becca. Um, and we'll have, be coming back to have uh, some general conversation later and we can, we can go farther. Uh, Keith Parker was a member of our delegation, was student uh, body president at Indiana University. Uh, also worked with a local chapter of Black Panthers. Um, he recently was cited with a special, was brought back to, to Indiana for a special recognition and award. And he said, back then, nobody was giving me any awards. So uh, Keith, tell us about your experience coming back to Indiana with the peace treaty. Well, I was elected student body president in March of 1970. And if you think that Indiana is a red state now, I can't describe how deep the red was in 1970. Um, so there was not a lot of, uh, what should I say? A, a lot of celebratory uh, moments 
uh, after my election. And in fact, it took a month for me to be sworn in because uh, there were a set of students and you know, it's funny to think about it. They wanted to stop the steal in 1970 with me because they couldn't believe that somehow this radical young black man with a lot of hair, which as you can tell is not there anymore, uh, was now the student body president and a face for Indiana University. So our activism uh, really grew out of, and our, our political party, if we could call it that, was the United Student Movement that was a coalition of black students and working class white students who started because of fee increases uh, having a negative impact on enrollment. We thought that if we come together and fight the university on raising our fees, that we could make a difference and provide more access and affordability for all students. When I was elected, we had to look at how do we merge these efforts and the efforts of what was happening on the anti-war front? How do we merge all of that together and build this broad-based coalition? And so that's how our United Student Movement was created. And that's the impetus for me being elected president. When I joined the delegation, uh, I was recruited by Rennie Davis to, to join the delegation. And I went to Vietnam. It was such a profound experience for me. Remember we were 20, 21 years old. And, and I personally had not seen the world and seeing the world from the Vietnamese eyes in terms of what happened uh, to people during the war, what its impact was, seeing children who'd been damaged by the bombing, by the chemicals. You know, we didn't call it Agent Orange yet, but we saw children who were born terribly deformed because their mothers had been exposed to the U.S. chemicals. It, it, it had a, a deep and lasting impact on me and reinforced a set of values that I had and further developed in terms of how do you make a difference? How do you care about other people? How do you express your humanity? And so being with our delegation and, and what's so wonderful about today, seeing people that I haven't seen in 50 years, talking to people that I haven't talked to in so long. I said earlier, uh, Mark Rasnick and I talked for two hours last night. The spirit that we had as a group was so important for us. And, you know, today I feel like we just walked out of the room and now we've come back into the room and we're picking up conversations we were having at that time. So I appreciate John for putting this together, for Jay for finding me. I was buying a Christmas tree at a Home Depot and I get a call with a number I don't recognize and it's Jay. And he says, Keith, do you remember me? Well, of course. And I remember, you know, the feelings that we had with each other. When I came back to Indiana after the trip, um, I was threatened with the Logan Act, which said that you committed an act of treason if you tried to negotiate with a foreign government against the interests of the United States government. And I was fortunate that I had a good friend in a law school at Indiana uh, who took my case, as it was, and argued, you know, first of all, this isn't a declared war, so Congress would need to vote to declare it a war. And secondly, there wasn't an, a negotiation with the Vietnamese government. There was a negotiation with students to students with people in Vietnam. And so it negated uh, the, the threat of the Logan Act and didn't negate, perhaps, though, uh, some of the antagonism that, that I and other people who have had opposed the war uh, encountered uh, during our time in Indiana. Uh, Indiana was a love it or leave it state. Those of us that are old enough remember those bumper stickers, America, love it or leave it. Well, I had lots of instances where I was told, uh, you need to leave it. Uh, the local grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan um, came up to me, he was a truck driver on the campus, and he handed me a business card that I still have. And the business card said, help integration, take a inward home for lunch. So there was a level of antagonism toward everyone 
that was a long hair, that was a hippie, that, you know, believed in the politics of change. And as a young black student, uh, certainly I was one of those targeted, but one of those that had a base of support among others. So I think about that experience and I think about how we use the treaty as our organizing tool. We couldn't begin to take that to city council in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, we couldn't begin to take that to the state legislature in Indiana, but we still use it among ourselves and we still found a reason to continue our struggle. So I'll stop there. Great. Thanks a lot, Keith. And speaking of the Logan Act, of course, uh, we now know that Richard Nixon was interfering with LBJ's peace initiative of the summer of 1968 that was, has now been fully confirmed, uh, working behind the scenes to sabotage the agreements and frankly, becoming extremely indebted to President Chu in South Vietnam for playing along with him, which actually complicated later negotiations as well. Ron Ikes uh, was one of our members of the delegation and went back to Oregon where he has been active, has been a journalist, has been an elected legislator um, and appointed to the Public Utility Commission. So Ron, who we just again connected with in the last few days, welcome. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, connecting with me, particularly Larry, who's the one who first connected with me. We knew each other a long time ago, both in DC and in Oregon. Um, I was elected student body president in May of 1970 at the University of Oregon, and I was not the moderate candidate. Um, was uh, one of the leaders of the all the anti-war activity around the student strike, uh, killing of students at Kent State, invasion of Cambodia, bombing, um, and uh, it was a record, actually a record turnout, and. Uh, uh, I won in the middle of all of that activity. And several months later, um, I went to the NSA uh, meeting in uh, where the where the People's Treats Treaty delegation and the concept of developing it, and it was approved. And then a few months after that, John Freund, who was an acquaintance because he was a faculty member at the university at the time, and I think was on leave because of the uh, activities related to the Chicago 7, shows up and says, do you want to go to North Vietnam? Uh, which was quite a surprise since, as has been explained, that was not the initial plan. Uh, but I decided to go and uh, we went and during Christmas break, uh, which made it kind of awkward to come back from Vietnam on uh, Christmas Eve, at least that's when I got back. Um, I have uh, a lot of random memories of, you know, little of some things that happened there. I mean, I remember the way too spicy steamed carrots, uh, playing ping pong with our hosts at the hotel, uh, smoking some strong tobacco, and it was tobacco, not something else, in a bong with our hosts at a park across from the hotel, uh, the manhole-like bomb shelters in the sidewalks of Hanoi, the museum with the large animated map of their victory at Dien Bien Phu, where the flag comes up right at the end. I remember David Ifshan burning my draft card at some rally because he'd forgotten to bring his own and used mine instead. Uh, I remember meeting Pham Van Dong, uh, bomb craters in the rice fields, and Taxis in Paris trying to find the way back from the, or way to the North Vietnamese Democratic headquarters or diplomatic headquarters. And I also remember the general contrast between the beauty of Vietnam and sort of the, the horrors and disruptions and destruction of the war. But there's a couple of things that really stand out. And I think Keith earlier alluded to them. The one thing that stuck with me the most was visiting the War Crimes Tribunal. And it was there that we sat face to face looking into the eyes of people whose uh, flesh had been burned from Agent Orange, of, as Keith alluded to, deformed, uh, deformed babies. And um, I remember one woman who, had, uh, who showed her arm that had so many splinters from cluster bombs that they could not operate because there were so many of them. 
And um, I sat there and I, I think it's pretty much the same for a lot of the people who were there. I sat there and I thought, you know, I'm not responsible for doing this. What I am responsible for is trying to stop it. <clears throat> and so I came back from Vietnam and from, from that trip with that attitude with the People's Peace Treaty. And also with a high degree of notoriety for having gone to North Vietnam, um, some of the same issues that Keith talked about. But because of that notoriety, I was able to give a lot of speeches. I was invited to a lot of places, including I remember going down to uh, Chico for uh, the University of Fresno State, I think is down there. Uh, getting invited all over the state, small meetings, larger meetings, talking about the People's Peace Treaty. And I think the real value of the treaty was as an organizing tool was two things. One was its message and its sentiment. And the other was its objective and the action items in it. But to me, what it enabled as an organizing tool was it was so broad based uh, that it reflected a larger sentiment. And I don't know, in my experience with the anti-war movement was that there were a lot of factions and agreeing on an approach, agreeing on a tactic uh, and bringing people in to take action based on the anti-war sentiment, sentiment was also often really very hard. And the People's Peace Treaty provided uh, a, a mechanism where we could do that. You could talk to small groups, you could talk to people who had never participated in a demonstration, but you could talk about the sentiment in the peace treaty. And as was also Jay talked about, you could also talk about uh, what you saw in Vietnam, what you learned about Vietnam and the Vietnamese, people to counteract the narrative from the government. So I think that served a major purpose. And in the end, um, in Eugene, we weren't able to get it adopted, but we were able to get use the treaty to get it on the ballot. And in May of 1971, on a, on a referendum, uh, by a 54% majority, the city of Eugene voted for immediate withdrawal from Vietnam. Great. Thanks. Ron, thank you very much. Um, brings back those, those days in, in uh, Vietnam very vividly. Um, Lee Webb uh, was co-director of Vietnam Summer. He lives in Maine. He was founder, co-founder of SDS, uh, worked in civil rights, anti-war movements. I met him in Vermont, uh, which is where I live, and he had a, a grand uh, run in Vermont as well, uh, past the old house that he used to live in probably twice a week when we're actually out and moving around in Plainfield. Uh, so good to connect with you, uh, Lee, and welcome. Oh, you're, you're muted. We got you. There we go. It was very right. interesting to learn um, the, the origins of this were with the National Student Association. Uh, uh, and my connections with the National Student Association started in 1980, 1962, 63 in Bloomington, Indiana, uh, and Tom Hayden, Rennie Davis, Paul Potter, and I were there, and we were just astonished. Uh, we were trying to get the National Student Association to pass a resolution against uh, lynching. We're calling on Congress to pass legislation against lynching, and the powers that be at the National Student Association uh, prevented us from doing that, we learned later that that was the CIA influence that wanted to make sure that the Southern delegations didn't leave so that they would be able to claim that the, um, that the positions that uh, NSA took on international questions uh, would be respected uh, uh, nationally. Uh, because of my experience with NSA, I got a call from uh, Warren Hinkle at Ramparts 1967 about a guy at NSA who wanted to tell a story about Vietnam. So I wound up uh, researching and co-authoring that 
article in Ramparts that exposed the CIA influence on, uh, on NSA. Uh, I moved up to Vermont in 1970. It's hard to think of it now, but at that time, uh, Vermont was very conservative. Uh, all of the local governments were controlled by Republicans, the House and the Senate, Republican, the governor, Republican, uh, Burlington and the small cities were conservative uh, Democrats. Uh, I got a call from uh, Rennie, who sort of, he and I talked regularly anyway, but he talked about uh, the, the peace treaty and could I get something started in Vermont? So I went to the caucus of the local uh, Democratic Party. There were five of us. Uh, I introduced uh, the resolution for the Democratic Party to, to sign a peace treaty with the, uh, with the Vietnamese. I got outvoted four to one. Uh, I then went to the town meeting in uh, Plainfield and uh, tried to introduce the peace treaty between Vermont, between the town and the Vietnamese and was ruled out of order. Uh, organized a demonstration at the state capitol uh, uh, calling for a peace treaty between Vermont and, um, uh, and the Vietnamese. And what was strange was that I got a call. I, I was, uh, I finished my talk, uh, and I uh, and I was, I thought that would be the end of it. And I, a, a guy comes out and says, uh, "Mr. Webb, uh, the Speaker of the House would like to speak with you." Um, and I, I thought it was a trick. I thought I'd be in jail in a week or two. I, uh, but I talked to him. He said, "Tell me, what is this peace treaty idea?" So you're asking the state of Vermont to sign a peace treaty with the people in Vietnam? I said, yes. And he says, well, if we're gonna do something about that, we've gotta we've got take it to the committee and then we've gotta take it to the floor of the legislature. And I said, okay. Uh, so I sat there with him and drafted the resolution. Uh, he introduced it to the uh, Committee on Civil and Military Affairs a unique Vermont institution. Uh, and it was then scheduled for the legislature uh, debate a week later. Uh, the, uh, uh, when it came up, the Democrat uh, leader of the minority, minority of the Democratic leader tried to table it and replace it with a position endorsing uh, uh, President Nixon. It was uh, defeated by a uh, Republican uh, who uh, took a stand against it. It was postponed for a week. And that uh, week later, the legislature was open. Um, it's on top of a hill. It's well lit during the, during the winter. And there was a debate um, uh, between the uh, people who wanted to pass a peace treaty between the people of Vietnam and the people of Vermont. Uh, and it went on for an hour and a half. And uh, people were ast astonished that we got 51 votes. We lost 51, I think, to 84, something like that. Um, but everybody was astonished that we'd done as well as, as we wanted. We got a, you know, we got a, a, a um, got a compromise at the end, calling for everybody to work harder to get uh, uh, to get uh, uh, peace. Uh, this was, um, again, Vermont was a very conservative state at that time. Uh, we wound up uh, just sort of the results of it. Uh, we, we decided that uh, we had to do something about the Democratic Party. So we uh, helped to organize a caucus of progressive Democrats within the Democratic Party. And uh, in 72, with the McGovern election, we took over, oh, I think about 50 of the Democratic uh, town committees uh, on that uh, uh, on that issue, and uh, we uh, and for me personally, I became very involved and started to focus my attention on um, on legislative issues. And uh, within a few years, um, uh, the Democrats were the same size as the Republicans in the legislature, they were far more uh, progressive. 
and we elected Pat Leahy to be the U.S. Senator, and um, Vermont has never been the same. And that's all thanks to the People's Peace Treaty. There we go. That, that's the endorsement we were looking for all along. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Noving Long um, was in Cambridge when I was, and, um, and I was learning so quickly about Vietnam, and no one was more helpful to me than Long or his newsletter, which was fabulous. And uh, he only lived two blocks from me, so I was able to check in occasionally. And uh, as I say, a lot of the focus that we felt through working on the peace treaty was about the Saigon student movement, the South Vietnamese peace movement, which wasn't well known. Uh, but Long was able to shed a lot of light. He teaches at the University of Maine, uh, and we want to welcome Long here to help wrap up this conversation. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me clearly? I uh, would like to pick up on some of the things that you uh, people have said. Uh, particularly, I would like to give some background on the, uh, on the reason why the uh, People's Peace Treaty came about. Uh, I think the, the, the main reason, briefly speaking, was because uh, Richard Nixon continually uh, sabotaged the peace, Paris peace talks. Uh, and also he was carrying out the, the so-called victimization program, which was a program for escalating the war and not for peace. So if you remember, if you recall, every time he went on TV, almost every time anyway, he uh, raised his uh, arms and he said there are two ways to peace. Uh, uh, the Paris peace talks and Vietnamization and that the one cannot uh, or could not go ahead without progress in the other. So, uh, so what happened is that uh, uh, f f finally, it, uh, and this is, uh, I'm trying to give a history here. On May 8th, 1969, the head of the National Liberation Front's delegation in Paris uh, proposed what was known as a 10-point overall solution to the war. Uh, and uh, if you uh, go back and look at it, you know, most of that later was contained in the, in the Paris Agreement of 1973. Nixon uh, rejected that peace proposal out of hand. Uh, he sneered, he said that it was only a return to the Geneva Conf Conference. So the National Liberation Front, in order to uh, rally support for the, uh, that peace proposal uh, in Vietnam and also internationally, in June of 1969, which was a month after the proposal, uh, the NLF, uh, uh, and the Alliance of uh, National and Democratic uh, and Peace Forces in Vietnam uh, convened a national congress which decided to set up the Provisional Revolutionary Government, the PIG, if you remember. And the PIG quickly obtained recognition in an effort uh, uh, for many of our governments and most of the groups in South Vietnam. Mm. Uh, in May of 1970, uh, 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 in an effort to prove that Vietnamization was successful, uh, Nixon uh, and Saigon invaded Cambodia. The invasion of Cam 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 Cambodia ended in a bitter military defeat and worsening political crisis for the regime. Uh, uh, every day there were demonstrations in the streets of Saigon. Uh, it, it create not, created not only increased anti-war activities in Vietnam, but also, also in the United States, as some of you have said. It was under uh, these conditions that on September 17, 1970, Madame Binh, the foreign minister and the head of the newly created PRG, presented the important eight-point clarification of the 10-point overall peace proposal, peace proposal. Uh, and uh, the eight point clarification while reforming the, uh, the demand for total and unconditional withdrawal of U US forces uh, from Vietnam and also allied forces. Uh, it specified that in a case uh, that the United States declare uh, the withdrawal of American troops from Vietnam, uh, 
just the, the declaration by June 30th, 1971. Then the, uh, then the People's Liberation Armed Forces would just would refrain from attacking uh, U.S. withdrawal, withdrawing uh, troops and so on and so on. And they also promised, uh, a, uh, asked for a coalition government composed of free and democratic uh, uh, groups, uh, free and democratic uh, 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 general elections and so on and so on. Uh, neutrality, democracy, National Concord. Most of the anti-war groups in South Vietnam uh, supported the PRG's proposal, but they could not very well endorse it publicly. Hence, they tried to reach out to the population in Vietnam and to the international communities in their own ways. The Saigon Student Union, uh, I was a member of, uh, I was a representative of the Saigon Student Union at the time, uh, I was its uh, representative in the United States as well as internationally. Uh, the Saigon Student Union uh, you know, tried to reach out to the American public through the U.S. National Student Association uh, in the summer of 1970, if I remember correctly. And that resulted in you know, uh, what you are talking about. Uh, the, the negotiations for the People's Peace, Peace Treaty, and finally the signing of the Peace Treaty in December of 1970. Uh, so, so what the Cyrus Student, Student Union was trying to do was create some kind of handouts uh, that would unite or, uh, or would create cooperation between uh, students in Vietnam and students in the United States, uh, and that would help uh, publicize the struggles, not only of the students in Vietnam, but also uh, of the peace movement in Vietnam. So, so that was what the students in Vietnam were trying to do. Now, Nixon, of course, did not want any ceasefire, did not want any peace. Uh, and he, so he did not want to go forward the, with the peace talks. Uh, and he wanted to expand the war in hopes of uh, uh, maintaining, of destroying the PRG and maintaining uh, the Saigon regime. And that's why in February of 1971, you know, uh, he and uh, the United States and the Saigon regime invaded Laos. And the inva invasion of Laos involved about 2,000 American airplanes, 45,000 troops, and so on and so on. I won't go into the detail here, but the rationalization was, quote unquote, to protect the Vietnamization program. This was irony of irony. So uh, students in Vietnam uh, and other people rose up and protested more. Uh, so in other words, the invasion of, of Laos invited you know, strong anti to uh, and anti-U.S. activities in South Vietnam, but because it was a, a, a military defeat, defeat of the first magnitude uh, you know, through, to Saigon, it also uh, uh, helped with the, uh, how do you say that, with the organization, with the protests, with the anti-war efforts in this country. Uh, now, uh, just, just to uh, make a story short, at that time, uh, as I said to you a while ago, I was the representative of the Southern Student Union in, the, in the, the United States, and also represent, international representative of the Southern Student Union uh, uh, interna uh, 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 sorry, uh, internationally. And so it was, uh, I was responsible for trying to explain what, the peace, People's Peace Treaty was all about. Also try to uh, tell the American public what was going on in South Vietnam uh, and in North Vietnam. Uh, uh, and so I went um, almost everywhere in the United States, uh, almost every week explaining what was going on in Vietnam, explaining the importance of a peace treaty uh, and um, so let me stop right there with, you know, that's what I was doing. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, all right, well, I want to thank all these panelists. Uh, everybody has a different perspective, a different participation, something new they've brought to the table. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot here. Uh, we want to open the discussion up to people uh, who are attending. Uh, I know that uh, Mark 
Resnick is here for one, who was part of the delegation. We'd like to hear from him. Um, and John, you're going to coordinate. <clears throat> is that right? The questions that are coming in. You're on. You're on mute. Protecting you from the dogs. Um, yes. Well, Mark, I'm opening right now, and as a participant in the trip, I'll let him add a few minutes, and then I'd suggest that amongst those of you who are on the screen now, you might want to spend 10 minutes in sure. conversation. And then we have a couple of questions, including a couple other people who are active in grassroots All right. work. Great. Okay. Hi. Mark. Hi. Am I? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm live. So, uh, and yes, I still do have the mustache. It's, uh, it looks more like the water buffalo now that the Vietnamese used to, used to call me. Um, I was uh, I was elected student by president at Case Western Reserve in uh, the spring of 1970. There was no moderate candidate, as far as I recall. Uh, I was asked to come on the delegation by Dave uh, Ifshin. I had been a member of the National uh, Supervisory Board of the National Student Association at the time. Uh, when we um, and, and then when, uh, but uh, John had asked me to talk about what. What, uh, what we had done after I got back. And I remember making a lot of, uh, uh, you know, doing a lot of talks, some very large with Jane Fonda in Ohio, um, some much smaller, a woman's club in Cleveland had actually invited me to talk about it. They, they both endorsed the treaty and, and, and contributed a lot of money to the cause, which was very nice. Um, I remember using the uh, uh, using the treaty um, when I, um, I had been drafted after I got back because uh, I, I had sent my draft card back to the draft board asking them to send me no more unsolicited mail. And uh, when I went for my physical, I brought the People's Peace Treaty with me and was handing it out to everybody. Uh, the only person who seemed really concerned was one of the security guards. Everyone else just took it and looked at it. Uh, not that they endorsed it, but at least it gave us a chance to, to you know, to, to have some kind of dialogue. I was not drafted, by the way. I've, I've had Crohn's disease since I was 15, um, not bone spurs. Uh, and, um, and then uh, when I got, uh, let's see, what else did we do? Well, it was, uh, I remember trying to get the Cleveland City Council to endorse the treaty, and that didn't go very well. Uh, in fact, I don't think we had any luck with any elected officials. I did want to mention that several years later, this was in 2000, I spent a sabbatical year with uh, Senator Kennedy on, 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 in, in Washington on his health staff. And uh, they, the University of Illinois, I'm, where I'm a professor, gave, the, um, gave an award to John McCain and, uh, uh, and Russ Feingold. And the university president takes me aside and wants to introduce me to John McCain. And he says that I work on Kennedy's staff. And McCain starts talking about Kennedy. And I say, hey, Senator, you know, you and I were in Hanoi at the same time. Uh, and uh, he looks at me and says, were you with Ifshin? And I said, yes. And he said, it took guts to do what you guys did, which I thought was very interesting. And uh, I, I guess in retrospect, it did. I didn't realize how much... Uh, fallout there would have been from it. I certainly remember my when I uh, arrived home and there was an article in the one of the Chicago papers. My family received a, a great deal of of, uh, of hate mail, almost all of it anti-Semitic as well as as uh, anti-communist, as as they put it. Um, and uh, let's see what uh, I have been back to Vietnam twice since then. Once. Uh, at, at a conference John had organized in uh, VNTN to talk about development. And there we were talking about the, the, the neuroscience exchange that we were doing with Cuba and trying to develop that in, in Vietnam. So I went back to try and organize it. And then the Society of Neuroscience sponsored a delegation where we spent about a week teaching neuroscience to, to Vietnamese and trying to, to organize an exchange program that didn't really work out very well. Their, their, mind, their major problem is head trauma from all those damn motorbikes and the refusal to wear helmets, uh, unlike the one I'm wearing there. Um, and that's, uh, I, I know John wanted me to limit it to two minutes. And I, I, think, uh, I think those are the, uh, the things that I, I wanted to mention. It's really been, certainly it was transformative and I, and I hope to see, uh, it's wonderful to see you all again. I've, I've seen Keith. I saw Doug actually in 2000. I remember when I was in Washington, and uh, and I I had an email communication with uh, with Ron, and I think that's it. So maybe we can maybe we can fix that. Great, Mark. Great to see you. Uh, 
to hear about your continued work. Um, let's look at any, any questions coming in from the uh, audience and some comments anybody wants to share here. Um, sometimes people ask the question of what impact the peace treaty may have had ultimately, um, combined sometimes with what impact the May Day demonstrated. I mean, the spring of 1971 was a very important time for the anti-war movement. There was the movement by the Viet Vietnam veterans uh, throwing their medals back on the steps of Congress, Dewey Canyon Three demonstrations. Uh, there was a huge mobilization in uh, April, uh, half a million people in Washington, of course, May Day. And I was reading, I mentioned recently before this Tad Schultz analysis in foreign affairs of the secret negotiations between late Octo and Henry Kissinger. On April 29th, Nixon said, no flexibility, POWs, must be released first before we set a date. Um, North Vietnamese troops have to move out of South Vietnam. And on May 31st, just a few weeks after May Day, Kissinger went to that meeting and radically shifted the American proposal position, saying that uh, they would accept the idea that POWs would not be released until there was a date set for the total withdrawal, and also indicating that uh, any so-called North Vietnamese troops in South Vietnam would not have to be uh, withdrawn. The only position he would not move on was Tu and the Tu government. And it's interesting going back to that idea of the sabotage in of Nixon of the Paris peace agreements in 1968. Nixon remained really stuck with Tu uh, and that became a stumbling block. But it, it suggests that the United States position did move significantly in May of 1971. Um, and uh, you know, I think that that was the beginning of the end uh, of the war and the negotiation. But again, Chu became a stumbling block. But anyway, others may have some thoughts on that. Uh, also, John, if you have any questions coming in. Yeah, well, let me uh, pose something that goes to everybody, which is, um, you know, I think several themes came out. One is the... Uh, repressive atmosphere, the somewhat in the mix of intimidation and surprising alliances and opening that came from from that experience. Um, what's striking about the People's Peace Treaty um, is its relative lack of precedent. I don't know whether, I don't think Paul Shannon's on, but Paul sent me a note that said that it they used it during Central America work. Uh, they used the same mechanism theme during Central America work. And I'm so I'm curious the extent to which you think that that People's Peace Treaty experience, both the visiting the enemy, the other side, and meeting with them and meeting the Saigon students who were our allies in a certain sense, um, how much that model is one that people ought to be applying to Cuba, to Iran, to Syria, or other places, and what whether you think the atmosphere in this country would be better or worse. Um, I am going to bring in Ron Mandel, who's done local work on the peace treaty, and we'll have a couple of some things to say. And if there's anyone else who who also did local work, if you could send a chat about it, and then I'll, I can open to you too. But at any rate, the question is what, how do you put together the reaction after you got back and the sort of similar problems, fortunately not quite as horrific as Vietnam, but similar problems that affect US relations in conflict zones? I could speak to that a bit. Um, I have spent most of my life since the People's Peace Treaty uh, reaching out to uh, the enemies of the United States and building people-to-people -people bridges. Uh, actually, just um, yesterday, I organized a webinar with the University of Tehran where we had uh, uh, five or six professors from the University of Tehran. We had an Iranian um, Armenian Orthodox Bishop and an Iranian Jew participating in the webinar. And then uh, myself and two other Americans um, 
also participated. And this is the second of our webinars that we have done. And the other one was hosted here in the United States and included an Iranian Ayatollah meeting with an American rabbi and an American uh, Episcopal bishop. But that idea of people to people, uh, getting together and talking together, building understanding and trust, even at a time when uh, our nation is not, is something that I've used in, in many different situations. Uh, same is true on, on North Korea. Uh, I previously also did a lot of work with, with Palestine, uh, Central America, um, uh, Iraq, uh, um, Iran, uh, Iraq uh, as well. So it's, uh, it is a, a lesson that I have continued to use. You know, let me add a point. Uh, when I was back in Indiana um, last year, I was I did a short presentation about uh, the, the People's Peace Treaty and other kinds of activities I was involved in. And one of the students said, well, where were you guys when uh, the U.S. invaded Iraq and, and the war in Afghanistan? Where were you guys then? We needed you then. And I said, we were old. <laughs> <laughs> and it was your time to develop a mechanism to create a movement. And, and I, I, th I think that, that may be one of the things that, you know, I feel not being able to pass that, that sense on to, to our, what would be our grandchildren, um, but that continuation of that movement would have been important in terms of impacting the country, not only in the 70s, but in the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s. Well, I mentioned to Keith last night that when they invaded Iraq, we had an interfaith banner, a huge banner, maybe 50 feet on a, a street in Evanston. And the hostility which with, which with we were met was profound. I have a question for, for my fellow People's Peace Treaty folks. Do you remember, did, didn't we bring back letters from, uh, from American uh, prisoners of war? And some of them were taken away and some weren't. Do you remember that or no? I don't. Um, I, I think we, it's my recollection, Mark, is that we were, um, I wouldn't say ordered, but um, it was specifically uh, not part of the plan that we were to do uh, anything related to prisoners of war during our trip. And I can't well, recall not... where that came from, whether it was uh, restrictions from the North or instructions we received. I do, there was when Jane Fonda went, uh, she did have a major controversy about bringing back uh, messages, but I think we, as I recall in our briefing sessions, uh, we were we were told. Oh, no, we didn't interact with them at all, but I wondered no. if we had brought back letters just that, you know, so that they could get here. I don't think so. No, okay. I brought back um, two things. One was a diary of a Viet, of a soldier, American soldier that was killed in Vietnam. Uh, which I had been made aware of before I left by Bob Greenblatt and made a request for the diary before when we arrived there early, didn't hear anything about it and was handed the diary by Swan Wine as we were getting on the plane in Hanoi to come back. Uh, in Paris, I was also asked to carry back the first confirmed comprehensive list of American POWs for presentation to William Fulbright, Teddy Kennedy, and George McGovern. I was asked to stay behind an extra couple of days because the Vietnamese delegation was sending, wanted to send us back and they were afraid if I came back with everybody else that we would all be shaken down and searched and they only wanted to communicate with the anti-war movement. So those are two things that I carried back. And that the, the diary was later published in Wynn Magazine. Ronald, I had Dale, something about the. Uh, go ahead. I just wanted to add something about uh, the precedent. Um, I think the real precedent there was that we, you know, was the talking to the other side and bringing back experiences and sharing those. And we, when I was preparing for this, I was thinking. Over the 50 years, what such a big difference it is between now and then about communicating with people. And remember how hard it actually was to organize 
is you're dealing with leaflets and tel telephones and, you know, and publications, alternative publications and, and word of mouth. And that's part of why the campus was one of the easier places to organize, you know, uh, as well as all the reasons because of the draft and et cetera. But, uh, you know, there were no cell phones, there was no social media, there was no 24 hour TV. So trying to organize then was really difficult and doing it in a way in which you could expose people to the other side. And I think two of the things that happened that affected the movement the most were the Vietnam veterans coming back and sharing their experiences. And in some case, in many cases, taking the lead and giving some credibility to it and the ability, a growing ability for um, exposure to this part of the world that most Americans didn't know about, only thought of as communist. And, you know, from the very first teach-ins, a lot of the whole anti-war movement was spent on educating people about Vietnamese people and about the history of Vietnam. And I think that, you know, as I said, you know, I, when I spent a lot of time talking about some of the things I remember, it did so in part because those of us who came back, we were people that could relate. We could talk about those experiences to, to people who otherwise would have no exposure to that. And so I, I think um, it did serve as a kind of precedent in that sense. And I think we forget sometimes how difficult, given today's world, how difficult it was to actually communicate and organize during the 70s. You know, I, I the think, 60s. I think the, the, the basic premise of American foreign policy has always been that everybody wants to be an American. And if you don't want to be an American, then we'll either convert you or we'll kill you. And it's been a problem that not only predates Vietnam, but it's a problem that you deal with today. When, when you look at American foreign policy, everyone doesn't want to be an American. They want to be who they are. And they, they underestimated or ignored that the strength of the Vietnamese was that they had fought the Japanese, they had fought the French, they were now fighting the Americans, they would later fight the Chinese. They wanted self-determination in a way that we could never communicate in terms of American foreign policy to change that to a recognition of let people be who they want to be, not who we want them to be. Yeah, I uh, am, would feel that particularly applicable in the U.S.-Cuba relationship. Yeah. That for all of the problems that Cuba has, it's its problems, not our problems. Um, Ron, you, you want to say something about how you used the treaty, what your involvement with it was? Yes, uh, first I want to say how much I've, I've enjoyed this um, this webinar. Um, it's brought back, brought back loads of memories of my participation in the anti-war movement in the late 60s and early 1970s. And I think it's a credit to VPM for running these webinars. And I think you need to reach out to the younger generation of activists to let them know what you're doing. I think they could learn a great deal from uh, the participants and we can learn from them as well. Um, I was a foot soldier uh, in the movement. Uh, as a student at the University of North Carolina, um, we were blessed basically by having a non-sectarian student left movement. Um, we were free of the sectarian warfare of the new left basically, which um, plagued uh, the movement in other campuses. Um, and I can recall in the spring of 1971, it was an interlude. It followed very intense activity um, in the summer of 1970, where we closed down the campus in response to the um, invasion of Cambodia and the killing of the students at Jackson, Jackson State. Um, and I think what was very unique about our movement is that we were reaching out to GIs. We had set up a coffee house uh, off the base of Fort Bragg uh, in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where we were reaching out to GIs. So when we had this meeting in I don't remember what it, when it was, April or May of 1971, we were reaffirming to the GIs, and this is a very important point, that the GIs were not the enemy. You know, um, I was fortunate enough to be, you know, get a deferment. I knew most of those GIs were working class guys who 
basically were following in their footsteps of their fathers and serving their country. They were not the enemy. But I'm going to go back to a point that Ron made earlier, and I think this is very, very important. Yeah. I think the real strength of the People's uh, Peace Treaty is that it humanized the war or the movement against the war. Um, because we're dealing with real people here. We're not just dealing with abstract, you know, issues about they war and peace. We're talking about real people who were suffering as a result of U.S. brutality. Uh, and it humanized the peace movement because we were able to reach out to GIs in the United States and say to them, look, we have a stake together to build a peace. Uh, this is, you know, you're not the enemy. You're with us. And I think um, I was very privileged to be part of that movement. But again, I want to reiterate the point I made earlier. I think you need to reach out to a younger generation. Um, you need to publicize the work you're doing because I think it's um, inspiring. I'll close Great. on that. Thank you. Ron, where are you right now? Where do you live? Um, I'm an ex-New Yorker. I've moved to um, England in February 1st, 1987, and I've okay. been living in, uh, living in Bristol. Okay, great. Frank Joyce, uh, who is a member of the End on Peace Commemoration Committee, um, will say a couple of things. And then there are two other people uh, whose names are ought to be recognizable to lots of folks, and I'll ask them to speak. Frank. Uh, thanks, John. Wow, what a great webinar, and how cool to see a lot of people I've not seen in a very long time. Um, this is such a rich discussion. Uh, that there's a lot that could be said, but uh, I'll confine it to one thing of the bigger picture issue that Doug and others have spoken to about people's diplomacy and about how that really informed the title uh, and the approach we took in our, our book, The People Make the Peace. Uh, when I was in Vietnam on my fourth trip uh, in 2019, one of the most fascinating political conversations I've ever had was with the deputy foreign minister who has the portfolio for the Americas, uh, among other things. And I'll just tease everybody with some interesting stories he had to tell about Donald Trump, um, who he was basically the uh, in charge of on two visits. But the conversation we got into had two points that are relevant here, I think. One is we forget that there, Vietnam, above all nations in the world, has peaceful and cordial relations with the greatest. See, is a skill of the Vietnamese government and of the Vietnamese people. And we don't acknowledge, I think, enough how much we both have learned from the Vietnamese and yet still have to learn. But a component of their diplomacy has always been people's diplomacy. And their ability to have these good and healthy and constructive relations with many nations, I think, incorporates that. Even more fascinating was the discussion we had uh, about the state of nation states uh, currently. And I think we can all zoom out and see that nation states and their relations with one another are, ain't what they used to be. And we may be on the cusp of a golden age of people's diplomacy for the young people that all of us are talking to that we really should use this experience to put that in perspective. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. One of the ways I've always thought of the peace treaty is that it was the second round of the moratorium. That is, it provided a vehicle to actually go to the grassroots and create all kinds of local versions of things that made sense. And we happen to have in the discussion, David, are you there? Uh, yes. Yes, we have on had in the discussion an old friend, David Hawk, who was actually one of the founders of the moratorium, and but has some very specific questions about the history of the People's Peace Treaty. Do you want to be visible or not? It's up to you. Sure, I don't, I don't care, but you have my questions, so you can ask no, no, them. Go ahead and ask them yourselves. I think it's more interesting. Um, okay. Uh, uh, did the South Vietnamese students 
suggest the idea of a peace treaty or did they actually provide a draft text? I think I can yeah. respond to that. I, uh, we don't know for sure where the idea actually came from, but uh, from everything that we have seen from the early articles and from my visiting, I think the idea was originally from the Saigon Student Union. And when I traveled into uh, Saigon with uh, and the, the only one of our delegation that made it in, I did not carry with me a draft of the People's Peace Treaty from the US. I actually got the draft from, um, from the Saigon Student Union and then carried that to the North. And we had extensive political discussions in the North. There was actually some modification, not a whole lot, um, but some that I felt would be comfortable with everybody. And then actually when we went to Paris and we met up with uh, Rennie and John Freund's, um, they wanted to do some more revisions to make sure that it would be a good organizing tool, not simply something politically correct. I think there was a little bit too much socialist language in the originally um, in the original treaties, and uh, they wanted something that would be familiar and easily understood in the United States. And we negotiated with the Vietnamese delegation in Paris while we were there to come up with language that would be useful for organizing because everybody, I think, understood the power of this as an organizing tool in the United States. Okay, I, I had asked the question about the students because it, it's right. actually been a lot of fun. Uh, my wife had been a student body president and I had worked for the National Student Association, uh, very good friends with Dave Ish. And, and we were just, uh, I think a few, uh, a year or two or maybe three ahead of uh, the rest of you who have spoken in this uh, delegation, but it was it's great fun to hear all this. Uh, I, I did have one other question about the uh, the text of the People's Peace Treaty, which I uh, I haven't read or looked at in 50 years and don't recall, but I, I wonder what provision uh, it made back then for a post-peace uh, regime in South Vietnam? My understanding was essentially that that was left to be determined by the Vietnamese people. Uh, that was not a part of the treaty. Uh, the Essentially the treaty between American North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese students was that the Americans would withdraw, the prisoners would be released, and the Vietnamese people would determine the future of their country. The, okay. If you go to the blog page that's at the top of the chat and is how you registered, go scroll down that page and you'll find the full text of the treaty as well as the stuff that Doug brought together of people who had endorsed it. Um, so that's, a, it's, I think it's a fascinating question, David, because it, how much Saigon students were thinking that down the track. Um, I would say, and Larry may want to reiterate and clarify this a little bit more. I mean, we do have this, you could characterize a situation of, though he can't remember it, the Charlie Palmer goes to Saigon, which he thinks was under Quaker auspices, since half of the people on our panel are AFSC related <laughs> or in VPCC or AFSC related. So sometime in 69 or 70, he goes to Saigon, meets with Saigon students, does not remember getting specifically the information about the treaty, but still Larry and Doug, or Larry and Jay remember him presenting it. Yeah, <laughs> so do I. Say. I remember him saying something about it. Yeah. With so, so to be off. fair, Charlie just had a cataract operation a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, you know, I, he can be forgiven uh, even maybe even a little more than the rest of us for having a fuzzy memory of this. But 
Um, what I do recall, and I was just going back and rereading the letter that, that Rennie uh, had me ha hand carry over to Madam Bin, is we had sort of a broad outline or a broad conception. I don't, you know, as I reread the treaty itself, I don't remember the exact wording having been codified prior to at least my trip to Paris, but I certainly remember having a, a, a broad idea of, of where we were going with it. And um, I would leave it to Doug and, Doug and Jay, who I think had a much more, uh, you know, more contemporaneous notes about what happened at the time. But uh, clearly there was sort of a, a general understanding of what the treaty would look like, if not specific wording. Right. At any rate, we hopefully will go even further into that in the late April webinar, which will involve Wintan Mam and some of the students, some of the people who were students in Hanoi or were working with the Peace Committee in Hanoi and related to the delegation. But I think it's, a, you know, maybe it's just important to the 50 people on this call. But I think it's a, a fascinating sequencing and, a, and an interesting illustration of how important the direct contact is from the other side of these conflicts with, with what is done on this side of trying to end them. Jackie Chagnon, an old friend, another AFSC person, uh, was with the Mobile Education Project when she came back um, to the US and, and has been working in Laos for many, many years in post-war Laos. So Jack, you had a couple of interesting questions. So go ahead and pick out at least one of them. From... Uh, I think my first one, can you hear me all right? Yeah, just fine. Yeah. Yes, okay, all right. Uh, I, my first one has to do with how many women were part of this? Because right now we've heard from one woman I didn't hear the first part of the program, I'm sorry, because I was getting my vaccination. Um, uh, how many women were there and how many women were the ones who who did the groundwork in many cases? Uh, I can answer. Come out. I, was, <clears throat> I was one of only two women on our 17 member delegation. Yeah. 15. Uh, well, I don't know, I, okay, 15. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, from, and, from my, okay. All right. Go ahead. But the anti-war movement, as you know, was very was maybe more than half of the big activists on campuses were women. Um, yes. Uh, yes. And this is this is um, somewhat left out in many pieces of the history, and I think we need to be conscious. Um, uh, about that. And also the involvement that um, we had with the Indochina Mobile Education Project was both male and female um, participating in it. And it was that balance of gender that I think helped us to be receptive in, in communities um, around the United States. Um, some of you, I don't know, I, I don't remember all the names of people that we met on the Indochina Mobile Education Project tours because um, I, I believe we, we went to over 550 places um, and that was five years of my life and my husband's life as well. So um, I, think, um, I think we need to recall that and frankly, I, I don't know if we even have a list because the Indochina Mobile Education Office was firebombed um, after the war. One point about um, Okay, um, I just want to tell one story about um, what happened to us in Missouri. Uh, it was my first visit to Missouri. I meet a man named Roger Rump who later becomes <laughs> my great partner. And uh, we make a presentation at the United Church of Christ. This is the heart of conservatism. Um, and we have a formal meeting and a, and a, uh, a dinner prepared as well. And uh, there are about 50 people attending. 
Most of them had veterans in Vietnam or had recently come back from Vietnam. They were almost all farmers. And at one point, a, the, a Vietnamese colleague who was with us says, um, says, please sign the peace treaty. And there was a violent um, response from a farmer who gets up and he's very tall and big and he says, Jackie, we've lost you. Very at that say we lost say you. again, we, we lost you. So start from the, what did the farmer say? <laughs> oh, so the farmer says, that man needs to be arrested. He is, he is a communist. And, and we were fearful for our life. Don Luce was with me and uh, Duan was with me and I was afraid he was going to attack Duan. So I stood right in front of Duan uh, and I said, please, please listen to what he is saying. And then very magically, a man that we didn't know gets up and says, sit down and shut up. I am a Vietnam veteran and I know he is speaking correctly. What, and, uh, Ho Chi Minh is the father of Vietnam and you should listen more and maybe we wouldn't have so many people dying in Vietnam. Everybody was silent. And that's what got us out of that small hole, hole <laughs> that we had gotten into. So I wanted to tell that story because it's important to talk in my mind to the ordinary American people who don't hear these messages. That night, we got so many signatures on that peace treaty. It was always in the back of the room. We would ask people to please sign it. If they chose to, they could read it and, and sign it, please. And we got a whole bunch of, because of that veteran's statement. Yeah. Great. Um, that great. I think, that, I think that was one of the things about the peace treaty is that it, it put us in touch with people that we were not normally contacting. And so what you're describing is very much a part of that. I think it helped to also spawn the Indochina peace campaign, which likewise reached out to people that we were not normally in touch with. And so as much as the politics uh, just the the expansion of who we're talking to. And I think that lesson is important today because in our local communities, we need to be talking to more people to really redefine what coalition is all about. I want to respond to the gender issue very quickly to remind people that the National Student Association with a coalition of student government leaders and Ron and, and Keith were on the board, I think at the time, uh, I don't recall a lot of women in the leadership role uh, early on in NSA, we had a lot of women on the staff. And the following year after David Ifshin, Margie Tabankin became the first woman president of NSA. But uh, I suspect that the Pickens on the board, and, and perhaps Ron may remember better than I, uh, were fairly male dominated at that point. And also, I, I wanted to point out that, uh, you know, most of the, it was Rennie basically, my understanding was that Rennie Davis' idea was, it was his idea that the Treat, peace treaty delegation be made up primarily of student government leaders, um, student body presidents. I was one of the only people who wasn't a student body president. I was editor of the student newspaper. So I think there are a couple of other student newspaper editors, but it was almost all student body presidents. And, you know, at that time, women weren't really running for student body president very much. It, right. In fact, the women's movement really a lot of the origins of the second wave of the women's movement was in the anti-war movement, where just a few years before I went to Vietnam, women were still expected at that time to do, run the mimeograph machines and do the typing, and the, the men were the ones who were, even in, on college campuses where we were all pretty smart and scholarly people and well-educated people, where the men were doing the ideological discussions, and we were expected to do the you know, the, the food and the um, mimeograph machines. And that was only in just a few years before I went to Vietnam on this delegation. So 
In, in <laughs> fact, in Vietnam, one of the things I remember very clearly was the celebration of the role of women. Those of us who were, you know, those of us who were males were really hearing a lot more about what women were doing and how they were, you know, the, 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 the greater equality that the Vietnamese were presenting relative to the U.S. And I remember I have a pin with a woman and a, uh, you know, one of the straw hats and an AK-47. It's green right. and yellow. I think we probably all have that somewhere. Uh, unfortunately, if you look at the new Politburo list yeah. from Vietnam, there's been some regression on that question, or at least not okay. implementation at high levels of leadership. The U.S. is actually doing much better at this point, particularly with our mm -hmm. vice president, than, uh, but also with yeah. a lot of the cabinet secretaries. So at where we've now gone uh, over, I wanted to ask, um, well, there are, two, there are two Vietnamese on the call. One, An Nguyen, seems to have gone off. Doug, you, if you can look at the Q&A, he has a question directly to you. If you could look at that, I'm going to ask Nguyen, Nguyen, Nguyen to ask her question, which is actually fairly focused on Lam. Um, and uh, then we'll come back and you can answer that, and that'll be the end of it. So go ahead. But, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I was not expecting you. Thank you so much, Mr. Um, uh Thank you to everyone for your um, stories. Uh, I, um, I was born uh, after the war, so I, I did not live the actual war, but I'm very interested in, in it. So that's the context. Um, and I, was, I, was, I also grew up in North Vietnam. Um, I, uh, currently I have a journal article, um, under review, a diplomatic history about the, um, anti South Vietnamese anti-war students in the anti-war movement. Um, and my research shows that they w were facing a lot of threats, um, and repercussions, um, not only in the US, but also in Saigon. Uh, so, um, and I asked them if they were afraid uh, and what helped them to overcome the fear. So I'm going to ask you the same question. I uh, have heard some of you mention um, the, uh, the consequences, the Logan Act um, uh, and some of the hate mail and so on. So I would like to ask if you were scared um, and if you were not, why were you not scared? And if you were, how did you deal with that? How did you overcome that? That's the question to all of you. Thank you very much. Thanks. So it's more generally, go ahead. Keith, did you want to answer? Or? Well, I, you know, I was subjected to a lot of harassment and uh, I had a COINTELPRO file, which was the FBI's um, surveillance and uh, the FBI uh, disinformation <laughs> campaign. Uh, my parents received letters. The church I went to received letters. Uh, I was, again, threatened with the Logan Act. At some point, I had a, a window shot out of my car, you know, and I had, again, numerous death threats. But I was 21 years old, and I thought I was invulnerable. And so I wasn't afraid. That was just a part of who we were at that time in our lives. And it wouldn't have stopped, I don't think any of us from being involved in the movement. I think we would have all have done that. Uh, we, we knew there was risk, but I don't think we analyzed the risk in any kind of depth. We knew this was something we had to do because we had a core set of beliefs. And you know the repression that I felt was nothing like people, black people continually feel and feel today, and we've seen outcomes from that. We didn't have a Black Lives Movement, uh, Black Lives Matter movement at that time, but we still had to be concerned every day you went out the door. But you still went out the door because there was work to be done. Um, I'd like to add something about that. <clears throat> I think there was actually a lot of fear, but we didn't even, we didn't call it fear. We called it paranoia because we thought we were afraid there were, you know, government agents everywhere and uh, 
you know, dirty tricks were being planned against us. We suspected it, but we, what, but we could never prove it. So we, we sort of called ourselves paranoid, but in fact, we had good reason to be afraid. But, um, you know, as Keith said, because we were young, we, we, you know, we did it anyway, even though we were afraid. Um, if I can sample Becca's point, I was one of the people who used to go around telling people, stop being paranoid, stop being paranoid. Don't, don't, you know, don't flatter yourself until I got my FBI file. And I was shocked to the extent to which that I was a unaware of what they were looking at and, and doing. And uh, so I think actually the paranoids were right. And I want to interject one other thing, which is that um, especially the women in our movement, Nguyen, now, were, were very inspired by the women of Vietnam the, who were, you know, you know, the women of the Ho Chi Minh Trail who were, who would write poetry in, in our, you know, romantic view. And this is, I, I was flashing this before. This is a woodcut. This is a, a woodcut that I made when I was 21 years old of, of, of our heroines of, of Vietnam that we were very inspired by. We, so the people who were really activists were very, very much inspired by the women of Vietnam who were so courageous. They gave us courage, you know, so that, um, yeah, I was followed by the FBI, but I didn't. I didn't care. I just went ahead and did what I felt I needed to do. I wanted to echo yeah. what Larry said. Yeah, in my FBI file, there was a uh, statement I had made in a small dinner of about eight people, and there was a conversation of a phone recording from uh, Mrs. Elliot Ness. Yes, that Elliot Ness, who <laughs> had called to donate money to to the movement. And yeah, so they were, they really were prying into us in, in, a, in a very intrusive way. So we well, are I'm, I'm in the future. Go, oh, um, I'm sorry, somebody wanted to say? Well, I was gonna add uh, a story to this. Uh, I think the, those of us who went to Vietnam found uh, some courage in what we saw there that our coming home and being fearful was relatively, you know, compared to what the people of Vietnam were going through. I think we came back committed to an objective and committed to a cause. I was fortunate in my case to be living um, in a community and on a campus that was uh, very supportive of the anti-war movement. So I did not face perhaps some of the uh, threats and consequences that others did. But of course we were all worried and all assumed we all had a degree of paranoia uh, about being followed. Um, and I took the attitude as, as Becca had sort of said, you know, most everything I did was pretty public. So uh, I sort of thought, well, I'll just throw all these, I'll throw, all, throw them all off by not being afraid not trying to hide anything. Um, but I found out in 1973 uh, that not only was a file being kept, but that the FBI had leaked that file to a right-wing radio commentator in Eugene. Uh, so I ended up suing the FBI, not for having a file, but for leaking the file. And I actually won the case. I got a public apology from the new FBI director and I got a settlement, which was actually pretty small, uh, probably could have gotten more. But uh, after my so-called liberal attorney who decided that um, he was actually gonna charge for the case, took his one third, I was able to take the two thirds I had left and donate it to medical aid to Indochina. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. All right, Doug, do you have an answer to An Nguyen's question? And then we will say goodbye. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Nguyen An. Um, both the students in Saigon and the students in Hanoi were very patriotic and very dedicated to their country. I must say that the students in Saigon were under more immediate threat for their meeting with me 
than the students in Hanoi were sure. for meeting with me. On the other hand, the students in Ho Hanoi were more likely to be bombed on a regular basis by American bombers than the students in Saigon. So they were both facing dangers in a slightly different way, but I found both of them to be very honest, to very, be very open, and to be very patriotic people. Thank you. I think that's a great place to end. And as I said, we will continue this discussion. We'll send everybody a note with the, when the time is determined, uh, it'll be in our newsletter. Um, I should say that if you look at the newsletter, you, you'll see that uh, this is a very busy couple of months coming up. Um, we have a program on the 16th of March around the anniversary of My Lai. That is, we encourage people to watch the whistleblower of My Lai first, and then we'll have some very interesting people from the production as well as uh, historians and and uh, Larry Wilkerson, who uh, some people may know him from his more current life or since he was chief of staff to Colin Powell at the State Department. But Larry was a helicopter pilot in Vietnam and uh, also used his helicopter to save some people's lives. So that will be fascinating. Um, we have a program on uh, the, I'm gonna blank on the dates of course, but there's a, a program on the role of the rel uh, religious sector of the anti-war movement and linking that to current um, anti-war act, current social justice work. Um, there is, Doug, what am I forgetting? I don't have the list in front of me. Um, we will be working, we'll, we're sponsoring, co-sponsoring a program on the anniversary of the Winter Soldier uh, hearings. Uh, we are, we will have a program for May Day. Um, we will have a program in the fall that looks at the whole COINTELPRO uh, set of issues partially as discovered by the break into the FBI office. So um, there, there will be a program around the anniversary of the Pentagon Papers release with uh, uh, Dan Ellsberg will be part of that. Um, so just to say you should be on the newsletter list or you'll be on the newsletter list. And uh, we are a little concerned that we have overloaded the circuits. We had 55 or so people here today and, and there will be many others who will watch the YouTube version and most importantly, we have captured history that no one else has done. And, and I think we're going to um, find ways of, or hope that all of this will generate more serious scholarship and, and writing. Um, we will, if Nguyen wants to have more conversation with individuals, send me an email and I can introduce you by email to continue that conversation. You're seeing uh, uh, Dr. Spock and Dr. King were not present enough to carry our logos before they existed. So we've uh, photoshopped this. Uh, this is a picture taken in New York after the uh, Dr. King had delivered his talk. And that helps to remind me that on April 4th, which is the anniversary both of his assassination and of his Riverside Church address. He will be, we will be encouraging people to do local readings of his Beyond Vietnam address. Uh, and we will also have a national reading that Jay has put together with an amazing array of artists and public figures, uh, uh, two people from Vietnam, one very prominent Vietnamese American. Um, uh, and again, you can see all of this list. Uh, I will, in the follow-up note, I will provide some links to these things. So you'll have that when I also send you the link to the, to the uh, YouTube. Okay, I'll be there. Okay. All right. So thank you again very much to everyone. The, if you are, 
either in modest or immodest means. Uh, if you go to vietnampeace.org, you'll see there's a donation uh, blank, a donation function there and, and your support is, keeps us going and allows us to continue to do these kinds of webinars. Uh, this is the one positive aspect of COVID that we have discovered a new way of uh, sharing and communicating with each other that isn't bound by geography. Jay, do you have any wrap up that you would like to say in this? No, I think that it's an opportunity not only to share history, but to actually clarify some of it and get it into a sharper focus. And I think you're right that there's more that we can do. I mean, I'm inspired to sort of continue to make some of these connections. So uh, I want to thank everyone for being a part of it, the generosity, the reconnection with people that were a part of it. Jacqueline's comments about what she did and David Hawk, of course, was a major force in the anti-war movement. Um, what a pleasure and uh, illuminating couple of hours. So thanks and let's stay connected. Okay, great. All right, so if I will close it down now and uh, I just checked, took a look at the last mailing and I did remember everything. So uh, I'm, <laughs> my mind is not as far gone as, as I feared it was. And uh, we have learned, met some new people this time um, and re-met some people it uh, turned out that Keith and I had known each other when he came on behalf of the Panthers to Indianapolis, where I was at that point. Um, so the world is small, but it's valiant. And uh, somebody, several people always raise the question of the next generation or getting younger people. If somebody has a magic way of doing that, we'd love to hear from you because we have tried very explicitly on some of our programs and it's not produced anything significant unfortunately so all we can do is do our best all right take care everybody